was just saying, so how do you write the life of a great man, or a great woman for that matter, because there are quite a few of those uh, around as well. Um, when I sat down to research my, re my, my, my most recent book, Not Far From Brideshead, Oxford Between the Walls, um, the first thing that really struck me was how many great lives were actually made in that city, in that time frame, between the two world wars. It sometimes seems to me that everybody who was famous in the first part of the 20th century was in Oxford in that time period. So ultimately I had to do what every author does and throw a sort of great lasso around a circle of people who interested me and use them as a sort of nucleus from which to filter out and write a bigger, more, more broad narrative. And I came to Gilbert Murray first of all. In 2016, I was actually on a book tour, so talking about uh, my first book. I was traveling around the country, going to various literary festivals, seeing lots of places I hadn't seen before. And I was up in Rydale in North Yorkshire. And that happened to be very close to Castle Howard, which I've never visited before. I didn't know very much about whatsoever, apart from through the televised series in the 80s of Brighton Revisited. So I called in while I was there, and I was completely overawed by the classical collection. First of all, looking at all the, the amazing busts which sort of line the great hallway, not to mention the dome with the sort of Ovid inspired painting upon it. And I think I must have been Googling on my phone. I looked up Castle Howard and classics, or some such combination of words. And through that sort of moment of serendipity, I alighted upon the fact that Gilbert Murray actually married into the family who inhabited Castle Howard in the 20th century. I thought, how extraordinary. I had never actually realised that I'd read probably most of Gilbert Murray's sort of main books, I guess, as a student. But I'd never thought to look him up as a person. I didn't know anything about his life. And something I say in the book, actually, as students, we practically never look up the biographies of the people whose books we're told to read. And I kind of wish I had, because I think it would have added a sort of extra layer of interest to me. So um, this was immediately fascinating. I ended up looking into Gilbert Murray's life more broadly. And uh, a bit more reading led me to the fact that he was the Regis Professor of Greek uh, at Oxford. And that there was some kind of drama over the period when he stepped down from that role in 1936 and retired and was due to be succeeded by somebody else. And this led me in turn to two other professors, Morris Bauer and the R. Dobbs. And suddenly I realised I had this sort of a, a very sort of skeletal uh, point in which to plot a narrative. It occurred to me at that point that actually uh, Gilbert Murray, the R. Dobbs, and Bob Morris Bauer are all quite well known to us as classicists, but they're not really outside of classics. And certain sort of by comparison of people that they associated with, so members of the Bloomsbury group, uh, for instance, uh, some of the great poets such as William Bruce and W.H. Auden. And they actually connect us to quite a lot of those figures through their various lives. So this is kind of quite an organic gestation to the book, and I see that I can kind of create a, a group biography and use these three characters to tell a broader story of Oxford in between the walls. As a biographer, uh, I've previously written on Catullus and the two Finneys. It would be a huge relief to discover that there's any kind of information uh, about the people who write about whatsoever. Um, the trick is doing anything in the modern world and find lots of memoirs, autobiographies, letters, diaries, and many things that can actually work with, not just using sort of descriptions. Um, but same time, I think, with like all pieces of self-reflection, pieces of autobiography, they're all quite problematic in their own way. Murray's autobiography uh, was actually published under the title An Unfinished Autobiography, uh, because it cut off soon after he began teaching at Oxford in his early forties, and it was left very, very incomplete. He actually lived uh, until the age of 91, so the whole stretch of his life that he didn't uh, document it himself. Morris Bauer wrote his memoirs, Memories, uh, from his childhood up to 1939, which is more than 30 years before he died. He claimed that nothing interesting had happened to him since then, which is obviously something to take the large uh, pinch of salt. E. R. Dodds' autobiography, uh, there's like the Q title, uh, Missing Persons, is the fullest 
of the Jew burial fleets. And Huntington has charged it through to his final years uh, at the end of the 1970s. The book actually won the prestigious Duff Cooper Prize and was toasted with champagne sent over by Madame Paul Roger herself. Uh, but as we dive into the letters and other writings of Dodd's contemporaries, including those of Bauer and Murray, we realise actually just how much is missing from that account. And um, missing persons proves actually to be quite an apt title. To write a great life of someone, you need to approach, I would say, what appear to be the most trustworthy sources with the utmost suspicion. <coughs> the phrase, straight from the horse's mouth doesn't really have any significance or bearing uh, on the writing of other people's property. And that's not to call that person a liar at all, um, but to recognise that memory can be very easily distorted and reputations, both that own per that person themselves and people that they know, um, can be very sort of carefully protected through acts of subterfuge. Uh, as a very simple case in point, Gilbert Murray notes in his unfinished autograph biography that his father died when he was nine years old. We know for a fact that Murray Sr. actually died when he was seven. There's no reason for him to have got that wrong, it's just a simple slip of the mind. Far more interesting are the silences uh, and courtesies you find in these men's books over topics, topics that they deem to be controversial. I mentioned a few moments ago the book of drama over the election of the new regent for the matter of week after Gilbert Murray. I actually chose to make this episode the centerpiece of my book, partly because of the very intriguing ways in which each of these people wrote about it. I tell the story of this in full in my book, and there's no time right now to go to, into it in any depth. Um, but sort of in, in general outline, Gilbert Murray being elected to the post of Regent Professor uh, in 1908 at the relatively youthful age of 42. And this remains uh, a highly prestigious position, uh, certainly in those days it made you not only one of the most senior academics at Oxford, but also a public figure, someone who could be called upon occasionally to give advice uh, by the government. Gilbert Murray followed in the path of a long line of notable scholars, including Thomas Gaysford, a uh, high school editor of ancient texts, and Benjamin Jarrett, of course, as well, who, in addition to his prowess as a pacifist, actually officiated at Gilbert Murray's wedding to Lady Mary of Castle Howard as well. Uh, Gilbert Murray actually worried at once, once he elected this post, that he was unworthy of the position. Dearest Puss, he wrote to Mary, he called her uh, Puss, she often called him Wombat, he said, because he grew up in Australia. Uh, it has become pretty clear to me that I am not fit for the chair of the week. I am not learned or industrious enough to organise a study. I am too diverse in my interests. He never left the top. Uh, the Greek professorship was actually created by Henry VIII in 1541, and it retained real prestige uh, above the equivalent chair in Latin, uh, which was established in 1854, so quite significantly afterwards. As the name suggests, the Regis professor was originally, at least, overseen by the monarch. Uh, who occasionally made the appointment through personal favour. Um, this is sort of a wonderful <coughs> anecdote that Queen Anne actually awarded the Greek chair to a specialist in Anglo Saxon studies because she admired not only his intelligence, but the fact that he was really brave when he underlined uh, a leg, uh, um, leg amputation. <laughs> so, slightly uh, to these grounds. Over time, the role of appointing the professor uh, was assumed by the Prime Minister in consultation with senior academics uh, at Oxford, but no one quite knew for sure how a candidate was chosen. At some point or other, the Prime Minister needed to persuade the monarch that their choice was the right one. But how much say each of these people had in the matter remained quite mysterious. When Gilbert Murray was due to retire from the post, he disrupted this slightly arcane process by offering a recommendation to the Prime Minister of the time, Mr. Stanley Baldwin. And as I argue in my book, this should never have happened. Um, it was really a breach of the tradition, and besides, led to life becoming considerably more difficult and uncomfortable for everybody involved. I, my personal feeling is that Gilbert Murray realised his mistake soon after making it, and his writings on this matter were all quite defensive. 
his preferred candidate when he recommended it to Stanley Waldron was the R. Dodds. And Dodds did succeed Murray. Uh, and this caused a huge outcry uh, in academic Oxford. Not only was Dodds an outsider, he had a very great for Dodds division, he had then gone off to Reading and then the University of Birmingham, where he was very happy. But he had controversially supported the East Rising uh, in his home in Ireland in 1916. Uh, his conscientious objector, his own politics, was used to be at variance with the right politics at the time. There was moreover a feeling uh, in the southern quarters of Oxford that a worthy candidate had been passed over for that role. This, in spite of the fact that Dodds actually published widely uh, in fields of philosophy, again, the same rule that sort of at variance with the sort of traditional classics. He had an interesting in Times, for example, he's quite a sort of slightly arcane author, um, and he was also a published poet. And these things were sort of different. From the traditional post. Most people had assumed that Philip Murray would be succeeded either by John Denison, uh, who became poet of the first Oxford Classical Dictionary, or by Morris Bower, who was, in a sense, a sort of self appointed protege. Um, Bower actually was pretty confident that he was in with a chance of getting this post, so he didn't. He was a press forward. Bower was a very colourful character. And his friend was either very important among the, the great wits of the 20th century. He's known for his puns, letters of various wordplay. And he says, most famously, buggery was invented to fill that awkward hour between evening song and cocktails. <laughs> and as well, a number of sort of apocryphal tales were, were told about him, so the most famous one is probably that he was busy bathing with a group of men in a sort of men's only bathing area of Oxford, Parsons' pleasure when a group of ladies happened upon them. And every other man in that group immediately sort of covered his genitals, but Barra covered his face instead. And then sort of how he the most recognisable at least to uh, strangers uh, in Oxford. <laughs> Barra was, he was incredibly popular. He had a lot of friends in high places. Um, this was for such a late Oxford morale of nearby Garcity Manor. He used to hold these slightly sort of notorious, slightly debauched uh, weekends for, for writers and musicians uh, at Garsington Manor. And Barra and his friends certainly helped perpetuate the idea that he had been wronged in this process and that Dobbs should not have got his job. In his memoirs, nonetheless, Barra said that he reg regretted the attention he attracted in the aftermath of the announcement. He wrote, he despised the publicity which made it appear that I was an uppish young man who had been properly snubbed. The truth is better reflected, actually, in the writings of his friends, including his eye Berlin, who knew just how much this opportunity meant to Barra on a personal and professional level. I argue in my book that there are a great many reasons why Barra did not get this job, um, not least uh, related to the standard of his scholarship comparison with others. Um, but some, I also believe there's two rumours about his sexuality. He was gay at that time. That's sort of a, an open secret among some group students, but by no means well known uh, within the fabric of Oxford. To bring out the story, um, I certainly couldn't rely upon what Bauer himself said at the start, quite an unreliable testimony. Uh, there's quite a discrepancy between what he wrote of his feelings in his memoir and what he wrote to Gilbert Murray straight after the election uh, in a letter. And what other people, including journalists, wrote about Bauer's reaction to the snub, as it was described at the time. Intriguingly, while playing down his soreness over the matter in his own memoirs, Bauer was far from effusive there in his praise of E.R. Dodds, whose only published book, as he put it, a commentary on Proclus, was beyond my scope. When Bauer published his memories in 1966, Dodds actually wrote him a kind letter to tell him how much he enjoyed the book, and in particular, Dodds wrote, to thank you for your generous treatment of that old Olympus in 1936. So I um, think it's a good old Dodds for kind of rising above the, the whole matter. Um, Dodds actually had a really miserable time on becoming Regis Professor initially. And he regretted leaving Birmingham so much so that when he came to write his own memoirs, he gave a chapter in which he described his relocation from Birmingham to Oxford 
the title uh, Paradise Lost. When he arrived, he found a lot of, um, I wouldn't say a lot, a number of academics actually advised the students to buy for boycott of lectures and people would actually get up to leave the dining table and sat down now. It's kind of a lot of juvenile silliness over his appointment. So the fact was dogs and Bella were never ever reconciled. The three lives of Murray, Bala and Dodds are uh, reunited then by this one job, one job that two of them held and one of them didn't. And for all of this job occupied significant stretches of their lives, you kind of get the impression that it was, it was actually really far from everything, particularly the two who held it. Bauer explained uh, in his memory that the outbreak of the Second World War helped him put the matter into perspective somewhat. But it nevertheless remained something of an obsession for him. For Dodds and Murray, on the other hand, he very much feels from, from their writings that the professorship was just one part of a very full life. I, so as a historian, I, I never fail to be amazed by how much people achieve urban history and how much they could actually achieve in a sort of single day. Um, and Gilbert Murray was sentenced to one of those figures. Uh, there's a whole wall of microfilm in the Bodleian Library in Oxford containing uh, the, sort of the, the copies of the letters of Gilbert Murray. There's actually 500 boxes of these letters. Uh, so that's quite a long time I've spent in the library trying to do a lot of uh, microfilm. Uh, but I think so you look at these letters and you realise, yes, Philip Morris holding this very important post of Reed's professor, but there's so much more to him. So the same day, you find him writing letters about that post, you find him writing to the Prime Minister, an Oxford colleague, a student, his wife, members of the Leagues of League of Nations Union, which he helped found, and a charitable cause. So he was an astonishingly busy man. And I think What's really important when writing a great life, a great life of a, of a busy person in particular, is that you're aware that you're unlikely ever to capture the complexity of anybody uh, in their entirety, no matter, no matter how hard you try to do so. And that may sound a bit sort of depressing and sort of defeatist on the part of, of me uh, as a biographer, but I actually just need it to be, to be helpful and realistic. Um, my view is that it's actually perfectly legitimate for a lot of us to choose areas of interest to focus in on. And sometimes I feel you can actually achieve a fuller understanding of a person by looking at a few sort of world chosen episodes in their lives. You can by trying to do a sort of full cradle to grade biography of somebody. Some brilliant books uh, have come out uh, in recent years which sort of adhere to this approach. Uh, I think, for example, of Napoleon, A Life in Gardens and Shadows by the skirt, which is a bit sort of like a true result of uh, horticulture, which is interesting. And of course, in order to find out uh, what is important, you need to immerse yourself in that life as fully as possible first. Um, you can't just sort of choose a blurry and then just go straight to them. Uh, I, just, I spent many, many weeks and months uh, in archives reading sort of the entirety of Bauer papers, for example. I read uh, the wartime di diary of Dodds, even if there was a that would be directly relevant to what I was actually writing about. And I also sort of gave a lot of time to the, the brilliant existing standalone biographies uh, of these figures too, especially Leslie Mitchell's biography uh, of Bauer, uh, the biographies of Gilbert Murray, uh, including that of uh, Francis West, and the more recent Rediscovering E.R. Dodd's Scholarship, Education, Poetry, and the Paranormal by Chris Drake, Chris Penning, and Stephen Harrison. So these are all marvelous books, uh, which really bring really you face to face with them as people as well as their, their scholarship. My own ambition uh, in writing my book was, was to paint a portrait of an era through the lens of this fascinating group of human lives. And examining ways in which these lives intertwined and intersected, particularly in the years surrounding the announcement of the new Regis Professor in 1936, I think would sort of enable me to, to do that. Um, there's no sort of one way of writing a life, there's only one sort of approach that I would sort of advocate for writing a biography. Uh, I mean, if, if this process of writing this book taught me one thing, is that to actually there's no direct sort of approach to anything. You need to sort of immerse yourself in people's writing, people's letters.
access and your scholarship, all of these things at exactly the same time. And I think as when you do that, you realise actually that the, the, the art of life writing is really diverse.